dabbling in CrossFit. I'm assuming that at this time, the, the CrossFit box wasn't as available as it is today. What drew you into that type of fitness, that the difficulty of the workout? Because it's not, it's a hard thing to mentally push yourself through that type of training and to get into that painful state and just endure and get through to the end, one, two, to then perform through that zone. What was speaking to you that maybe other athletics or um, other types of training and conditioning weren't? Like, you know, you chose to go into CrossFit, not become an ultra marathon runner. Yeah, which both, I mean, you know, CrossFit's, you know, I, I was introduced to CrossFit in 2006. I was working at a conventional gym at the time. Uh, I just, I, I really, I, I like the idea of having a coach. I like the idea of having a clock and getting more work done in less time. That's what I liked. I, I thought it was very efficient. And I liked the results I was getting from it. It's not to say it's better or worse than becoming an ultra marathoner. You have to have a lot of mental uh, push to be able to do something like that. Um, but I think it's just it's just where I where I found, and, I, and still today, I love, like we use this concept called RPE of rate of perceived yeah. exertion. And I love pushing the pace. I, I love getting after it. Like I, I enjoy, and I get a lot of this through jujitsu now, where I enjoyed having training sessions where you're just, you know, you're done. You're just spent. You've given it everything yeah. you possibly have. And I enjoy that now in jiu-jitsu, whereas I used to get that from CrossFit a lot. Now my CrossFit, I still push hard for sure. Yeah. It's just different than what it was before. Yeah, the, for people listening, the RP's ratings of perceived exertion, it's essentially like a 1 to 10 scale of your effort of how hard something is when you're done. That's something that I struggle with within jiu-jitsu is managing that because I love the RPE 10. I love it. I, that When you have a day where you have six or seven hard rolls in you and you're, you're gassed, gassed, it's a few feelings like it. How do you manage that? How do you manage your weekly RPE between being a freak in CrossFit, maintaining that, running gyms, running the philanthropic events, taking care of your daughter, going and training jujitsu, you know, training and coaching service members and border patrol and stuff like that. I mean, the exertion level <laughs> perceived from someone else is that's an 11 constantly. So how do you manage that for yourself? I mean, I think from a training perspective, right, it's, you know, I try and allocate certain time of the day to certain things, right? So like, um, you know, mornings and evenings will be spent with the family during the day i'll be able to switch off between business stuff and and training but i think when it comes to training specifically i i, I do think it's difficult because i gravitate towards the higher rpes and i've had to remind myself that if i want to be doing this for the rest of my life i need to evaluate you know i don't need to be at a level 10 every day all day i need to have some days that are a six or a seven and i need to just walk into the gym that day and just be like dude i'm checking my ego at the door I'm, I'm, I'm staying low key. And it's funny because I went into, I went into the gym. I went into, I went to the gym on Monday saying to myself, Hey, today I'm going to go hard, but I'm, I'm going to try and go like at an eight. Yeah. And all of a sudden the coach is like, Hey, today. And I made a mistake of going to comp class. I shouldn't have gone to comp class. I should have gone to another. So that's my own fault. Right, I go right. to comp class. I'm like, Hey, we're going to do 20 rounds of two minutes on rotating with, with teams of three or whatever. Yeah. And dude, it's just, you can't do that and then go do CrossFit later and expect your body not to respond just being beat up. And even though I cold plunge and I sauna and I <laughs> do this and I do that, like, dude, I can sleep for 40 hours and it's still not going to help me with my recovery for something like that. So I, I got to be more careful about that.
I mean, it's, it's a constant evolution, right? Now, the way I like to look at it is that our goal at NC Fit is to help people live freely and live fully outside the gym. So let's, let's, let's talk about that for a quick second. I think it's a really important note yeah. for your audience to, to recognize. My goal is to run an organization that helps people live freely, live fully. And what that means to me is that if you and your family are on a vacation and your dad's a badass CrossFitter, you never have to worry about him saying, hey, dad, let's go on a hike together. You think your dad cares? No, he'll go there tomorrow. He'll go there instantly. If you yep. say, hey, dad, you want to go swim in the ocean with me? Done. Hey, dad, you want to go bike? Hey, dad, you name the item and your dad's like, yep, I'm on it. No big deal. It's not even a factor. Doesn't even consider it. What that means to me is that your dad, right, has the capacity to live freely and to live fully. So to not be inhibited by his physical capabilities ever, meaning he yeah. doesn't have to worry about sitting on a toilet and getting back up again, nor does he have to worry if he wants to go do something, he doesn't have to worry about that because he has a physical capability. And for me, when I think about the training we do, or even in jiu-jitsu, it's the ability to enhance my life, to live freely, to be able to go do whatever I want, and to go and go express that. If I want to go climb some big-ass mountain, I should be able to go do that. Yes. Now, if that's the premise, and that's the theory, right, to be able to keep up with my kids, to be able to do whatever, if things take away from that goal, I need to put myself in check. So I'll give you an example. I was... Uh, I was doing a CrossFit workout the other day, and I was just, dude, I just toasted myself. I think I did, I don't know, it was like a couple hundred lunges, a couple hundred <laughs> squats. It was, it, was just, it was just a lot, right? Yeah. And because I test a lot of workouts, and this one was a little bit over-programmed, so we adjusted it back down. But, you know, for like three days after, um, I was going to go play catch with my son, and I'm trying to run. And, dude, I couldn't run because my legs were just so smoked. Yeah. I just said to myself, like, what am I doing? I was like, I can't even play catch because I'm so messed up. I was like, that's yeah. not me living fully, right? Like, I need to go ahead and check my intensity. And just, if I had just dropped it back 10%, I wouldn't have been that sore. I would have been fine. Yeah. I would have been able to wake up in the morning, you know, jog a little bit, and I would be like, but if you go too hard, too often, it's inhibiting your ability to hit those goals. And that's a constant daily reminder that I go through right now. I love that. Because that's a, that's a longevity-based approach. You know, I... I think about that all the time, like when, when we'll travel somewhere, the ability to, to jump in with a guy who's 57 and just do stuff, it's, it's very inspirational for me in my 30s to be like, I, you know, it's crazy. Getting older is it's such an experience, right? And it's something that I, I think in my head, I never want to admit that I'm aging. And so I, I just like negate that all the time. Whenever people say, oh, I'm getting older, I'm like, just shut up. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to hear you embody this like, willingness to let your body just start to shut down. And so I, I don't think about it that much. But as you get older and you see your friends, you see people that you know start to lose function in their body, which is crazy for a 34-year-old, right? Yeah. I have a, a friend going in for back surgery. I have multiple friends with blown knees, ACL reconstruction, hip surgery. These are things that in my head growing up, I thought these are geriatric issues. These are 60, 70, 80 year old issues at 30. And it's taking away that live freely, right? I, I can't go snowboarding anymore because my back hurts. So I can't go. You know, that, that idea is terrifying to me. And I want to do everything in my power and help people to do everything in their power to never have to have that conversation with themselves. Yeah. Well, I mean, what you're talking about is living full, like, to go snowboarding, to go climb, to go do whatever, yeah. those are choices you make to like to do things that you love, right? Or, yes. or you want to do. Like you have a goal and aspiration. But imagine living freely. Meaning like imagine someone who is intimidated to walk up stairs because yeah. they or or who can't even get off the toilet without utilizing some type of device to help them get up or off the couch. Those are those are people we need to hit now. Because yeah. they don't even have the physical capability to even perform daily functions, which is a huge issue. And that's only going to get worse and worse and worse. You know, like, imagine, you know, it's really interesting if you look at like some Asian cultures, their mobility is absolutely incredible. Because oftentimes uh, families will sit in a squatted position and or on the floor in different positions. And so I think there was a study that came out. I'd have to reference it for you. They said that um, statistically... You know, as you get older, one of the ways that you end up, you know, passing or getting, you know, really hurt is by falling, right? Yeah. And so when you fall, either you can't get back up again or you break something. But in some cultures where they're used to getting on the ground and getting back up again, 
They use that as a reference point to see how long your longevity is because these people have to have the physical capability to go down the floor and get back up again. And I feel like that's an art that many Americans don't spend time on the floor. And we can start doing that just as a, as a, fun, as a very basic uh, thing. You know, instead of watching TV on a couch, you can watch TV sitting on the floor. Um, it's something that I spend a lot of time doing just to basically create more, um, you know, range of motion. When I was, uh, I did a trip to Bali in 2017, and when I was there, I hiked Mount Rinjani, which is this huge uh, volcano. It's like an overnight hike, and you have Sherpas that go with you, and, and they do, like, gear porting. And we stopped for lunch one day, and I was watching the guy cook, and, and he was sitting straight up ass to grass, and he was like, bam, 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 bam. Like, he had six plates out, and he was just cooking everything. And I just sat there, and I was like, no one else was paying attention to it, because whatever, this guy's just sitting on the ground. And I was sitting there, and I'm like, wow, you know, we've, through our lifestyles, we've robbed ourselves of very basic body mechanics. Like, to sit down onto the ground and cook something at a fire, that's, uh, let's go back, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years, right? Something that we just do. And now, in a very short amount of time, with technology and everything that's part of our life, like me sitting in this chair right now talking to you, uh, we take that away from ourselves. And then when you need it or want it or when you want to live freely, do something basic, like get up off the toilet, you don't have that there. Yeah. And it was such like a stark contrast to see how ingrained that is in an otherwise just generally active lifestyle. You know, this guy's not going to the gym. He doesn't go to a CrossFit box. He's not taking yoga classes. But every day of the week, he walks up and down this mountain <laughs> and he cooks food. And yep. He was doing, he literally had a cigarette in his mouth while he's doing this. Now it's just like cracking up, right? But it uh it is sad to see I think that's one of the reasons that this profession or adjacent profession is so amazing. And even jujitsu too, right? Like you look in um an academy and you see you everyone, if you've been doing this for a while, has seen that person that has gone through a transformation through being there, right? They're starting to cardiovascularly be in better shape, which is affecting their heart health. They're becoming more mobile by experimenting in these positions. It's a really powerful place to be. Yeah, I, I think, I think both, I, I think that all of that is true. You know, I, um, it's, it's funny. We, we have a, we have a location in Shenzhen, China that we operate in. An NC fit. Yeah. We, we run corporate wow. wellness locations for Western digital. And it's yeah. so funny. Same thing happened. And these guys just excellent. These guys, it, it's just, it's interesting when you spend a lot of time in different cultures, how, um, how things that we consider norms like have just evolved over so many years, but to many other cultures, like just sitting on the floor or like you said, cooking that way, it's just, that's just the way it is. Like yeah. it would not. Yeah. And I think standing desk, like right now I'm standing, right. I have a standing desk in front of me and, you know, I think standing desk sitting on the floor, um, and, you know, if you talk to Kelly Surrett, the author of Supple Leopard, um, he has a new book coming out, by the way. Um, Sweet. But, uh, I'm but here for it. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. I just think that little stuff like that goes a long way if you're trying to enhance your overall fitness. And then finding jiu-jitsu or CrossFit, I think, is a great next step. And, you know, for anybody who wants to try and pursue fitness, you know, I think just walking, especially, yeah. like, with your kids, just getting them walking. <laughs> so is a great way to you, talk to, you talk to healthy people, and it's the simplest answers. Like, I, I can't tell you, I, I, if I had a dollar for every time that I recommended to a close friend, family, acquaintance, whatever, that they increase their daily step count. I mean, I sound like, you know, it's a broken record and I feel like people just don't digest that information. I'm like, but you don't understand like metabolically why it's effective to walk at low heart rates for long distances, but also just what you're doing for yourself. You're using that thing that you live in to like yeah. <laughs> move around. Yep. And then if you go into like, you know, some of the stuff that I've been diving into lately is some knees over toes stuff, trying to do some yeah. backward stuff. Um, I'm going to be having him at the gym in, next month, which I'm really excited about. So there's so much information out there. I just think that people can't get hung up on it. You know, simple is better and consistency matters. And I think that's whether it's your jujitsu or your CrossFit or walking or whatever. If you do it for a month, a week, a year, it really doesn't matter. But if you do it for years and years and years, that's where it really starts to impact. And that's where I'm at kind of in my jujitsu journey is I'm looking at it through this really long lens um, and just seeing where I want to get to in the next you know, 10 years, for example. You know, I, I want to touch on, uh, you had mentioned these two components, which I actually really like the addition of living freely because I think about the, the living, sorry, you said living uh, freely and fully. Fully, thank you. Uh, the living freely, but the living 
the living freely part is an addition that I hadn't really considered in the past, like how that's actually different than fully, that there's, there's two separate experiences there. Yeah. And as someone like yourself, fittest person in the world, CrossFit Games winner, that you know, we could just rattle off insane metrics of, of weight that you've moved or times that you've ran. By every you know, bit of the words, you're strong. And I would venture to say mentally strong too, right? Because you can push yourself through these tough situations. You can grind where other people fall apart. You have that determination. Being someone like that, what was the experience like when you found Alana's diagnosis? Um, Ava's, yeah. Ava, I, uh, sorry, Ava, Ava. Yeah, all good. Um, I mean, obviously it was, you know, you know it, was, it was terrible. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think to your point, um, so yeah, there's definitely a difference between freely and fully. And then I'll, I'll answer your question. But, you know, freely, again, it's like, dude, it's not good enough just to not have to worry about getting on the toilet and getting off the toilet. That's a prerequisite for life. Like, if you have yeah. to worry about that shit, we got to start there. The fully piece, like if you're worried about climbing Everest, you need to train for it. That's a that's a beautiful problem to have. And you should be yes. proud that you're at least striving towards that goal, you know. Um, but in regards to, you know, uh, yeah, the diagnosis, I mean, obviously, that was that was detrimental, um, you know one of the greatest gifts I think that the CrossFit Games ever gave me was the ability to, you know, overcome adversity um, in a sport. And adversity in a sport is much different than adversity in life. Um, you know, and I, I think that when you develop, you callous your mind in words of uh, you know, like David Goggins and Jocko and whatnot, if you're thinking about it through that lens, you can callous your, your mind. Like you could, you could learn how to overcome microdose of adversity for years then when shit hits you in real life, you can have a better chance of overcoming it because you've compartmentalized. You've learned how to handle these things through sport. And that's why I think for any youth or any person, getting exposure to sport is so, so valuable. Yeah. Um, and physical fitness in general because you learn how to overcome microdose of adversity. You don't want to do another bench press. You do it. Boom. You just are winning. You you don't want to work out, but you go push yourself. I have a cold punch. I don't want to get in it. I get in it. I'm now learning how to overcome this thing, right? Yeah. And I think those are the, the life lessons that really helped me um, during Ava's um, diagnosis. Now, she hits, um, actually, next week, she goes and she rings her bell, which is an exciting time where basically when you ring the bell, it signifies you've uh, beat cancer. So wow. she's doing that next week. So that's a, that's a, that's a big deal. Man. Next Wednesday. Yeah, I, I, I don't cry often from just looking at photos, but you had this photo of you uh, in the hospital bed and she's like it's she's tending to you and oh. her head's shaved and everything and I was like I, I, I just I can't imagine I'll never be able to and hopefully never will have to you know imagine what that's like to be there and the the like helplessness right there's you can't work harder at getting her better it's yeah. uh, but then to see on the flip side of that that the most amazing thing is what you and your family have done with with the philanthropic side of it, right? To turn this into like something so positive for other people that might be going through something like that, and instead of it ju just being an experience, an experience that can then and it's by no surprise given the way that you talk about helping other people, but that it can have an impact on other people's lives too. And other people that might be going through something like that when she was starting to get better. And on the, on the flip side of this, how much does she like play into the, the philanthropic side of it? Is she, is that something she's aware of and excited about and, and loves participating in? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's, you know, she's almost 12 now. So, you know, she's, she's aware enough and so she spoke at our last uh, Ava's Kitchen event, which is an annual fundraiser for pediatric cancer. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, a friend of mine, actually, um, Jordan Harbinger, he has a really popular podcast. He, that sounds so familiar. What's, yeah, the, he, what's the name of that? Uh, I think it's just the Jordan Harbinger podcast. But him and I were talking, and he sent me a text, and he's like, um, hey, we were ta talking about just business or whatever. And he's like, well, any problem that can be solved with money isn't really a big problem. And it was just interesting because he's right, right? If you have a big problem and this is, you know, money related, they, they, they're, they're, they're morphed by, um, if that's even the right term, um, by, uh, by anything that has to do with non-money related, like 
a family member being ill or whatever it may be. Those things are very difficult because like you said, you can't just throw money at it. You can't just throw attention at it. You have to throw um, expertise from doctors uh, and, and, you know, prayer and, and other things. Like, you can't, there's no easy solution. You can't just go out and get a loan to solve this problem, right? <laughs> right, right. It's going to take weeks, months, years, and a lot of work. And, um, yeah, we're very, very grateful. And, and, and she, she plays a big role in what we're doing right now to help families. And uh, we're just blessed to have the, you know, outcome that we currently have. And, you know, not every family has that same outcome. And, you know, we're well aware of that. And so for that matter, we will dedicate ourselves for the rest of our life to supporting uh, children and families fighting pediatric cancer, it's just a, it's just a non it's a it's a non-starter for us that we will always um, be dedicated to that cause and blood drives and other things that we do to 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 play our small part for the gift that we are given. Um, that's the way we look at it. I have uh, one of my training partners named Alex. He was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma when he was a kid, yep. and I met him through the academy and. Just like, man, that dude inspires me so much. It's crazy. Like when he just wears this smile on his face, that's you can't buy it. It's just his his contentment and, and enjoyment of being alive and able to participate in all the amazing things that life has to offer. It's it's so welcome. Like it's really a special thing. And I I, I was really it, hearing him tell the story of the whole thing when he was younger was really intense. You know, the, the visits and the helplessness and everything, but to come out on the other side of it and have a positive experience like that seems invaluable. I, I saw a video <laughs> of you, uh, like her preschool workout routine. Oh yeah. All the time. Yes. Yeah. So I we, love, So yeah. Tell me about this. How, Cause I think this is rad. When I was like 15, I could not wait to go to the gym. I don't know why. But you weren't allowed until you were a certain age. And I was, like, counting down the days. I didn't even know what I was going to do when I got in there. But the idea of being able to go and train was, like, the coolest thing to me. And yeah. seeing this video was really cool. How did that come about? Well, I mean, we train. So we train once a week. We train um, stand-up and groundwork, right? That's a that's a prerequisite at our house. Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, 100%. Oh, rad. And, I didn't and know also, this. And also, like, Muay Thai. So we, yep. we have basic... You know, basic framework of Muay Thai and groundwork is a prerequisite for us. We spend a couple hours a week doing that. And then every morning we spend um, working out. And it's just a part of the routine, right? It's a way to level set for the day. It's a way to get the body moving. No matter what you do, the morning's in your control. Just wake up a little bit extra early, get after it. And that's just been something that we we just do. Um, and it's been really, really cool. Um, I think that it's been really valuable from a strength training perspective, I've, I've really worked with her to realize that like lifting weights, you know, within reason, um, with appropriate technique is, is not a bad thing. You're not going to get big. You're not going to get bulky. You're going to get toned. You're going to get strong. You're going to be, those are lessons that we're learning at a really young age. And it's just evolved. You know, it started off when she was like, I don't know, seven or eight. It started off with just like walking in the garage, watching TV. And then it just evolved and evolved and evolved to where it's at today. And um, I just think it's a good way to, to teach children, you know, like my son included, this idea that, you know, you could learn so much about yourself through fitness because you could be going in there and you don't want to. And again, like we said, there are these micro doses of, um, there are these micro doses of adversity that I think just compound. And so when you do reach a real adversity at school, you're just better off handling it. And I think that any parent that tries to shelter their child too much, the reality is, is that eventually life will come and kick you in the nuts. It, it will. It's just, it's yeah. going to at some point, right? And I, hopefully it's not that bad, but at some point it's going to kick you in the nuts, whether it's a relationship or whatever. And so the more that we can mentally prepare for that through physical activity, I think is key. And so that's why we do it. I, on that note, um, kind of learning that the le- the lessons that fitness can teach you. Uh, uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about was your master's experience at Master's World. Watching the matches and seeing, I think it, you had a quote about, you know, I've never lost anything in my life that was decided by a judge. <laughs> and seeing, you know, having competed myself and knowing the intensity of those matches when you're really going for it, it's five minutes, so you know it's all out. Uh, you guys go into overtime, and then you go all out again, and then to have a decision go to the other person's favor, what did that feel like for you, having that out of your your control? 
Well, I mean, ultimately, I mean, obviously, it didn't feel good, and and I ended up winning a tournament a couple of months later, which which felt much better. But yeah. <laughs> you know, ultimately, what it came down to was that, you know, it was my own fault, right? And I think that's the secret: is that you can immediately, you can immediately switch, flip a switch, to go from a victim mindset to ownership, right? Like, yeah. I, I could have played the victim, like fuck that, you know, why? Blah, 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 blah. But immediately, I just told myself, like, dude, why am why even say anything? I should have been so dominant that it never ended up in the judge's hands. Like, bottom line, like. Uh, and I always used to think about that with CrossFit. Like, if you got a no rep in CrossFit, it was different than in this case where literally the, the judge was one advantage to one advantage and the judge just said, hey, this guy won. But in right. CrossFit, it's like you get a no rep, a no rep, a no rep. Like, that's not the judge's fault. That's your fault. And you need to fix your movement because you stopping an argument with the judge is not going to do anything positive for you. And you complaining about it later on is not going to do anything positive. So you might as well address it in the moment, realize it's your fault, and move on. And, and that's really... Another lesson I learned through jiu-jitsu where competing and having a, a, a judge make the decision was tough, but I should have been more dominant. So yeah. for next Master Worlds, I got trained to be more dominant. Yeah, it's a good, uh, it's a good lesson in, in ownership. I like that word a lot. I feel like it's something that we can all attempt to embody a little bit more to use less excuses. And it's tough, though, in those moments, you know, when you get hit with it as a competitor and there's a lot of emotions that rise up, but to, that's the only way to get better, right? The only way to improve is to recognize that there was something lacking in the first place. Otherwise, you're yeah. not going to be driven to do that. And, and you're just going to you're just going to play the victim, right? It's like, yeah. oh, the referee is like, you know, my son was playing in a football game the other day, and he was they, they were complaining about the referee. I was like, bro, stop stop focusing your attention on this. Focus on your gameplay, what's in your control, because the way the referee is in a ref. Is out of your control. So why are you why are you dreading on it? And, I, and those are tough lessons to learn. But the more you compete, the more you realize that it's in your best interest not to dwell on those things because it's not going to enhance your your performance. It's actually going to negate your performance. So you might as well you know, you know what I'm saying. So yeah. it's in your best interest to make those changes immediately. Yeah, and that's the athletic evolution. I'll um I'll leave us with one more question here. Sure. I wanted to give you kind of like a so it's a. a, a a three-part question. You get to keep one of these elements away from your competitors. You get to burn one of these elements so that no one can ever use it to get better. And then you can buy one of these elements because you think it's that valuable to training. A ski erg, an assault bike, and a concept rower. A ski erg, an assault bike, and a concept, concept two. two. Concept two, yeah. And I get to give one. You get to Keep pay one. full. Pr- you get to pay full price for one because you yep. love it. You get to eliminate one from the industry, and then you get to keep one away from your competitors so that they can't use it as a, a tool to get stronger or more conditioned. Oof. I'd buy the assault bike. Yeah. <laughs> I'd I'd keep the rower away from my competitors. Yeah. And I um the third one the skier. You right? just eliminate it. Yeah, you yeah. eliminate the skier. Yeah. Yeah, the assault bike man is such a beast. Why why do you think why what why do you have that answer? What is it about the assault bike that you see as such a valuable conditioning tool over something like a concept rower? Well, I mean I, I think both are good, but with the rower, I think you can get a similar ish movement by doing like a higher rep, lighter load sumo del of tie pull. Um mm. I just think there's yeah. nothing like the assault bike in terms of the um cardio that it that elicits you know i i I, it's just the air bike is just such a dynamic tool because it's getting your legs and your upper body incorporated at the same time i just find it to be extremely impactful for aerobic capacity intervals it's great so i just yeah it's a phenomenal training tool and is that what you say that that's one of your more utilized uh conditioning tools for martial arts for jujitsu uh yeah i would because i think that Oftentimes, the better you get at jujitsu, the worse your conditioning becomes because you become so efficient at your movement. And yeah. so getting on an assault bike is a really great way to um, to push yourself to a red zone that you don't normally find in training, the better you get. Like, yeah. if you're the best guy in the room, it's hard for you to hit it. Not routine. rolling. Right. Yeah. And so if you could jump off the mats and get on a assault bike and then get it back on the mats or whatever, you could get that RP that we're looking for. Well, then I I have to ask this because this is my dream scenario, right? Do you see in the future and and maybe within the 
the walls of NC Fit or outside of this new kind of like training facility developing where you have the growth of martial arts is unprecedented, right? You had the growth of UFC, won championships across the board. Everything's getting bigger and bigger. ADCC, IBJJF, it's more and more in the fr- like public sphere. And I think you have a lot of people that are, that are athletic or conditioned that are starting to enter into it. Do you see a CrossFit style box with like a 50, 50 split of, you know, mats and conditioning for jujitsu and grappling sports mixed with a box and that actually being not like an academy that has some weights in the corner or vice versa. But do you see that as a possibility within these two kind of uh, adjacent industries? I think it should be. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if you identify experts in each field with a professional person to run it, I think you'd be really successful. So the answer is yes. I don't, I haven't seen it done to the level that I'm thinking. I've yeah. seen it like either one is kind of like an offshoot. Like you have a CrossFit gym with a small jiu-jitsu or you have jiu-jitsu with a small CrossFit gym. But I think doing it right um, is definitely a possibility for sure. Well, one can dream. Jason, honestly, it's been such a pleasure. I, this could have been another three hours. I think there's a lot of different things we touched on that was really just the tip of the iceberg. But I know you're busy. I want to respect your time. And I really appreciate you taking an hour to sit down with me, man. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, uh, I, if anybody wants to find out more about what we're doing at the gyms, uh, you can go to nc.fit. They can visit Instagram, Jason Kleepa. If you're a gym owner, make sure you check out the NC Fit Collective. And and uh, yeah, let's rock and roll. All good. Yeah, and we'll throw uh, links to all of those in the show notes below. So if you go down, you can get links to all of Jason's different endeavors and contact points. So thank you.